The volunteers are helping clean up and restore a Jewish cemetery in Philadelphia today. The facility is the latest target in a series of attacks and threats against Jewish gathering places in recent weeks all across the country. Correspondent Laura Engel is following the story from New York tonight. We are going to begin shortly the process of reunification. Another wave of bomb threats called into Jewish day schools and Jewish community centers and offices across the country Monday sent adults and children into the streets to wait for law enforcement to give the all clear. That's really scary to hear that there was a bomb threat. Nearly 100 threatening calls of this nature have been made since January in over 30 states. All calls have been deemed hoaxes by law enforcement with no bombs. Some reportedly are robocalls. Others have a live person on the line, which has made it tough to determine exactly from where the calls are coming. Then there has been the vandalism at Jewish cemeteries in St. Louis and Philadelphia, where tombstones were overturned, grave sites desecrated. The director of the JCC Association of North America issuing a statement which reads, Actions speak louder than words. Members of our community must see swift and concerted action from federal officials to identify and capture the perpetrator or perpetrators who are trying to instill anxiety and fear in our communities. Like the White House exactly. condemned the threat. The president continues to be deeply disappointed and concerns, uh, concerned by the reports of further vandalism at Jewish community cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries rather. And while security is being ramped up in front of synagogues, Jewish cemeteries, and religious institutions nationwide, some in the Jewish community want to see more done. We'd like to see a plan of action put in place, and this this demands leadership, and it demands leadership from the top. It's too early to tell if there's been an uptick nationally in these anti-Semitic crimes. The FBI tracks hate crimes in the U.S., but hasn't released its 2016 figures yet. The NYPD did, however, give us updated stats for New York City, reporting that as of Sunday, the number of anti-Semitic hate crimes has nearly doubled since this time last year. Brett? Laura, thank Seven you. Baltimore police officers could get up to 20 years behind bars over charges of robbery, extortion, fraud, and more. These seven police officers uh, acted disgracefully. They betrayed the trust that we have and we're trying to build upon with our community. Investigators say the officers worked together to file fraudulent timesheets, making off with nearly $400,000, and that's only in the last fiscal year. On top of that, the officers were indicted for allegedly filing false police reports, taking cash from innocent civilians, and even turning off their body cameras to avoid oversight. So these are really simply robberies by people who are wearing police uniforms. And this isn't the first time some of the officers were on the wrong side of the law. The Baltimore Sun reports the city had paid more than $500,000 to settle court cases involving members of the group. They're 1930s style gangsters, as far as I'm concerned. Death toll rises in two terror attacks in Afghanistan, the near simultaneous Taliban bombings hitting the country's capital. One targets a police station, the other the intelligence service offices. Connor Powell is following that story live from our Mideast Bureau in Jerusalem. Connor. John, these uh, twin attacks in Kabul come just a few days after a senior Taliban commander was killed in a U.S. airstrike over the weekend. And some people are saying that this is connected to th that, uh, uh, that attack and the killing. These attacks, though, are very similar to what we've seen the Taliban carry out in Kabul really for the last decade or so. A pair of attacks targeting government, military, police uh, buildings and headquarters using a bomb in the first case in the western part of Kabul, a large car bomb exploding near the gate, and then attackers with guns rushing in. A several hour gun battle then uh, followed. Ultimately, the Afghan police and the military were able to kill all the attackers, but not before 16 people were killed in total uh, between the two attacks and dozens more were wounded. Now, President Trump last night uh, talked about a lot of things uh, in terms of national security, but he did not talk about Afghanistan uh, last night during that State of the Union address. But the Pentagon is working on a plan whether or not to send additional troops to Afghanistan, whether or not to ramp that war up. But, John, the larger issue that the U.S. has had in Afghanistan for the last uh, several years or so is it doesn't really matter all that much the troop numbers when the Taliban have been able to use neighboring Pakistan as a base of operations to go in and out 
of Afghanistan attacking both Afghan civilians and police and military and U.S. forces. The larger issue has not been the number of troops in Afghanistan, but how to deal with that safe haven across the border. No word yet, John, about what the U.S. might do in terms of that issue and how it deals with the overall problem of Afghanistan. And America's longest war grows even longer. Connor Powell. Where Christians are still fleeing persecution from north, the northern region of the Sinai region. Continued attacks from the Islamic State have many wondering if the government is doing enough to protect them. An evangelical church in the northeastern area of Egypt is stepping in to help. They've seen more than 500 people pass through the church. They are handing out food, water, and other supplies. The church is also helping to house Christians in private homes in and around the city. On Thursday, a union of 53 companies backed transgender rights at the U.S. Supreme Court. Among the companies participating are Apple, Microsoft, and IBM. Oral arguments are scheduled on whether the Gloucester County School Board in Virginia violated a federal anti-discrimination law when it blocked Gavin Grimm from using the boys' bathroom. Grimm is a female-born transgender high school student who identifies as male. A ruling is due by the end of June. The joint brief from the company says they are concerned about the stigmatizing and degrading effects of the policy implemented by the school Some board. Some churches in Chicago are adding a little bit of sparkle to this Ash Wednesday. That's right. It's being called Glitter Ash Wednesday, and the gesture is meant to be a show of support for the LGBTQ community. Several churches in the Chicago area are mixing in a purple glitter with the ashes. A pastor from one of those churches said she wants to make sure the Christian message is one of love and tolerance. Ash Wednesday is a ceremonial day when Christians are marked with ashes on their foreheads, ushering in the fasting season. The French port town of Calais is one of the hot spots of Europe's migrant crisis and its mayor has now responded by banning food banks for newcomers. She insists the measure is necessary to maintain order. It's not a directive against the distribution of meals, but against gatherings because these lead to law and order issues as well as security and waste problems. I took this decision to make sure that no permanent base or squad is created around Calais. Well, look, she's trying to avoid another major jungle camp from sprouting in her town, essentially, before it was demolished late last year. Over the past couple of years, the Calais migrant camp had steadily grown into effectively a tent city. At its peak, the population was around 10,000 people. It had its own economy. It had makeshift shops, restaurants, uh, even nightclubs and hairdressers. And the process of do demolition was extremely controversial. It attracted the international media. There were clashes between large groups of migrants and the police. There were rocks thrown, tear gas often deployed. And as you said, I've reported from Calais extensively and I've seen with my own eyes the way in which the situation spiraled out of the authorities' control. Well, this is what part of the south side of the Calais jungle looks like. And those living just metres away are thinking about where to go next. Many refugees here are still desperate to get to Britain. That's why they're refusing accommodation in official asylum centres. Well, this is what's been happening uh, throughout the day here. People have been taking their possessions, and if they are lucky enough to own uh, or live in a caravan here that's been donated by volunteers, they're simply moving it from the south side. Authorities here are under pressure to show that they're cracking down on the now infamous tent city. But it's a problem that appears to be moving rather than going away. Well, the mayor's motivation in trying to introduce this new rule is almost understandable because before it was dismantled, the camp was putting such an immense strain on her town. Calais is already one of the poorest areas in France. The migrants there were constantly putting out roadblocks. They were disrupting uh, cross-channel traffic. It was resulting in accidents. And all that really impacted tourism and local business in the area. And it really divided the local population. It's left a lot of people increasingly anti-migrant and feeling quite fearful. But another portion of locals who see people that are destitute, 
And of course, the issue is that migrants are still coming to Calais. And there's this sense that Calais' problems aren't going away. I've had many a private conversation with uh, town officials, and they say that because of its location, Calais will always be a problem spot. Healthcare battle heating up on Capitol Hill as GOP leaders try to unite around a plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. Uh, the They're being hit by Democrats and some Republicans for keeping their plan secret under lock and key. Our congressional correspondent Mary Bruce tracking the search. So Mary, what's going on here and what do we know about the new bill? Yeah, George, 20 million Americans are waiting to see what's going to happen with their coverage. And now there's a new draft to overhaul Obamacare and a bit of a new fight to go along with it. House Republicans are keeping this new draft under wraps for now as they make revisions. But that is and not sitting well with Democrats who are eager to see what they're up against and even some Republicans who opposed an earlier version. Now, Senator Rand Paul is blasting the secrecy. And yesterday he went on a bit of a public hunting expedition here, going through the basement of the Capitol, trying to see if he could find this document, but he says it's being held like a national secret. And even leader Pelosi offering to help out with his hunt, tweeting that she would be willing to release the hounds. George. Yeah, they are going after it. You know, they're trying, they have to keep it secret because they know the trade-offs are tough here. And once the details get out, it's going to anger and rage one faction or another. Absolutely. And House Republicans here are simply being extra cautious, especially after an earlier version leaked and then was met with some pretty swift opposition. So for now, just the Republicans on this House committee that are drafting the bill are able to see it. But George, that could change soon. They're expecting to bring it up for consideration. In today's ET update, stars of the new film Beauty and the Beast open up about what to expect from the highly anticipated live action movie. And we want to get you caught up on what they're saying. And to help us, we've got Jen Perro, senior news editor for Entertainment Tonight. Jen, the premiere was last night, the stars were there, and they commented on the buzz. What is the buzz? What did they say? Okay, so I think this story has kind of gotten a little out of proportion. So basically, Josh Gad is playing the role of LeFoe, who is Gaston's best friend. And of course, you know, Disney has never had, an, uh, had a gay character in any of their movies in all this year. So um, a couple of fans, of course, start speculating on social media that Josh Gad's performance in this character uh, seemed to be gay. Um, it was never ever written in the script as it was director Bill Condon said, you know, it was never his intention um, for this character specifically to be gay. Um, it's just the way that Josh had performed it and the way that he was acting in one scene that's getting a lot of people to speculate, you know, are we, do we have our first gay character in a Disney film? So um, the director said, you know, I'm going to leave it to you guys. It's wonderful. I can't believe I'm actually talking about this, that this is even a big deal or a conversation in 2017 um, that we do have a gay character in the Disney movie. Um, but yeah, it's kind of just like open to everybody's, uh, you know, translation, their own experience. Up for interpretation. Exactly. Okay, another reason to go see the movie. Right, I'm excited. This looks amazing. Okay, we got that I one on the one. list now. I want to ask you though, Paris, uh, Michael Jackson's daughter, Paris, she's got a new contract. What's this about? Yeah, so she actually just signed with IMG Models. Of course, mm. IMG Agency is one of the biggest modeling agency in the world. Giselle Boonchin, all the Hadid sisters belong to them. Um, so now Paris is officially a model. You know, she actually has kind of gone on her own um, in recent months as a singer, as a writer. Mm -hmm. Her social media account has over 3 million followers. Wow. Um, and she's also a designer. She actually designed that dress right there that you see that she wore at the Grammys last month. Um, yeah, so now add modeling to her resume as well. It's been a hard few years. So we hope this very is hard. Good yeah, but you know her, it's yeah. really nice to see how independent and how strong Paris yeah. is as an 18-year-old daughter. So I can't wait to see what she's going to do. Big things ahead of her. I want to talk about this classic couple from the 90s: Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> we haven't heard these two names in the same sentence in a long time. And now we are. What's going on? So, um, of course, Brad has separated with his ex-wife, uh, Angelina Jolie. Um, Brad and Jennifer Aniston were, of course, married for five years. They divorced in 2005. And now sources close to the couple are telling us that they're talking again. They are uh, text messaging. They are staying in contact. But Jennifer Aniston actually gave an interview a few years ago saying, listen, you know, we were married. We spent five wonderful years together. We're always going to be in each other's lives. And they still share text messages on birthdays or mm -hmm. um, on her wedding day, Brad reportedly wished her um, good luck to her and Justin Thoreau. But yeah, now we have confirmed they're friends again. They are talking. So oh. a Brad and Jen reunion? I don't know. I love her and Justin Thoreau together. No, it's so but complicated. Never it's Angelina seen Jolie. It's so complicated and six kids in the mix. No. Um, so yeah, these two are fiercely private, though. I don't think we'll ever really know how serious the relationship is.